All right, uh, for the benefit, benefit of my students during uh, a series of protests at Dickinson College, uh, which is keeping us out of the classroom maybe this week, uh, although maybe there will be a cure uh, in the next few days. I guess the administration is responding to the demands on sexual assault and harassment. Um, but I canceled class the other day or yesterday. And uh, so I thought what I would do is uh, do a fairly quick lecture on Republic, Plato's Republic books uh, three and four, which I guess otherwise we might miss because uh, we're already behind the syllabus. Um, okay, so where we've gotten in at the end of Republic book two is uh, they're trying to figure out what justice is and they're trying to figure out what it is to be a just person, a just individual. And, you know, in that, I think in that sense, justice for Plato uh, is more or less all virtues rolled into one. Like how, it, it's, it's quite equivalent, I think, or, you know, basically equivalent to the question, what does it mean to be a good person? Now, uh, what, Socrates proposes toward the end of book two is that it might be easier to figure out what a just society is than what a just individual is. Because if you blow it up on a larger scale, you can see it more clearly. I'm not sure how plausible that is, but uh, all right. And so we're going to go at the question of justice through uh, the question of how to organize a city that is a nation, I guess, a small nation. Um, all right. Now, uh, and so that begins maybe the, uh, or a central project of the Republic, that is to design the ideal society. Um, and what he comes up with is a form of aristocracy, which should be translated from the Greek something like rule by the best, or Aristotle just describes it as rule by a few. Um, although you can have bad rule by a few, according to Aristotle too, call that oligarchy. Um, all right, so uh, it, it's a form of meritocracy, I, I, I propose to you, that that's the kind of if there's a form of government that Plato's advocating, it's a meritocracy, rule by the best. Uh, it's worth pointing out again that this position and Plato's whole authorship, really, and Socrates as a as a uh, historical figure, are all opposed to Athenian democracy. Sometimes people fudge that or try to obscure it or something, but uh, nothing could be more obvious, all right? Um, which is ruled by the people, you know, or ruled by the many, as uh, understood. And of course, the Athenian democracy executed Socrates, which would tend to irritate you. And it would make, uh, if you were Plato, Socrates is a student Plato, and it would make you uh, tend to think that there's something wrong with this as a form of government, I think that you just executed the person who Plato thinks anyway, and he wasn't alone actually, was the best person in Athens. Um, I think he was basically executed for being anti-democratic. Yeah, that's one, I think one of the uh, offenses. Um, okay, so now we're gonna, so we're gonna start to describe what that is. Uh, one thing is he thinks of a city-state as being, uh, divided into three sorts of people. Um, okay, so there are, uh, or, or his, his ideal city-state anyway, uh, to consist of, uh, just to preview later books, the philosopher kings. This kind of meritocracy is ruled by they who know. It's ruled by the knowers. That is, it's like, it's, maybe like turning the country over to the faculty of Harvard, right? which a lot of people informally advocate. Uh, I mean, I would say that's basically Barack Obama's position, let's say, right? You know, the people who run, should be running this sucker are the experts. Like I said, there's a lot to be said for that. 
and a lot to be said against it. Okay, but uh, that's that's the position. So basically, he starts by sort of asserting an uh, organization of the city-state into three groups, the philosopher kings, the guardians or auxiliaries who are uh, the soldiers and police, and then everybody else. He does, you know, the craftsmen, tradesmen, and farmers, for example, this kind of thing. Um, okay, so, uh, then we'll, uh, you know, um, let me just read you a passage. Uh, this is marginal page, uh, four, four, four thirteen C, um, in book three of the Republic. Um, then I, Socrates, uh, say, we must inquire who are the best guardians of this inward conviction that they may always do that, which they think is best for the city. We must watch them, I say, from their earliest childhood. This is the future philosopher kings. Um, giving them actions to perform in which people would be most likely to forget or be deceived out of such a belief. And then we must select those whose memory is tenacious, who are proof against deceit and exclude the rest. Okay, so, I mean, basically saying like, it's okay, in this meritocracy, we're going to have to raise, uh, really attend to the education of our best youth. That's going to be the key, actually, to uh, creating a decent society. Right? I don't know if he has in mind like a standardized testing regime, but I'm not sure he'd be entirely opposed to such a thing. Uh, although, I guess maybe it's a standardized dialogue machine or something instead of a uh, regime, instead of uh, fill in little bubbles. Um, Okay, so there's these three classes of people, and one problem is that the, the, you know, people are liable to resent the philosopher kings, okay? Uh, it's this familiar. People resent whoever's in power, often. Um, and not only that, but these philosopher kings are extremely vulnerable, okay? They're the little eggheads, right? Uh, and they're, you know, they're trying to rule soldiers and farmers and stuff like that. They're liable to get overthrown. Uh, so how can we preserve this three-part class system without a constant series of rebellions? You know, well, Plato's answer is uh, famously what he calls the noble lie. <laughs> we're gonna the way we're gonna control population is really by thorough thorough education uh, and by relentless propaganda um, so okay so I'll just read you a little famous bit of uh, um, book three where he describes how we're going to make people satisfied with their class position, I guess we'd say, uh, in one of these three classes. I mean, I guess, uh, especially the lower couple. Um, okay, so this is on page 68 of our textbook, 414, uh, just above C, marginal page. Um, can we contrive, this is Socrates, any ingenious mode of bringing into play one of those lies of which we spoke just now, so that pro propounding a single noble lie, we may persuade even the rulers themselves, if possible, to believe it, or if not them, the rest of the city. Um, what kind of lie, Socrates? Nothing new, but a, Pho a Phoenician story, which has happened often before now, as the poets tell and mankind believe but which in our time has not been, nor, so far as I know, is likely to happen, and which would require great powers of persuasion. Um, I shall try, I say, to persuade first the rulers themselves and the military class, and after them the rest of the city, that when we were training and instructing them, they only thought 
as in dreams that all this was happening to them and about them, while in truth they were in course of formation and training in the bowels of the earth, <laughs> where, <laughs> uh, where they themselves, their armor, and the rest of their equipments were manufactured. As soon as they were finished, the earth, their real mother, sent them up to its surface, and consequently, um, that they ought now, ought now to take thought for the land in which they dwell. Um, we shall tell our people in mythical language, you are doubtless all brothers, as many uh, as inhabited the city. But the God who created you mixed gold in the composition of such, as, uh, such of you as are qualified to rule, which is why they are most honored. While in auxiliaries, the uh, soldier class, he made silver an ingredient, assigning iron and bronze to the farmers and other workmen. Therefore, inasmuch as you are all related to one another, although your children will generally, generally, although your children will generally resemble their parents, yet sometimes a golden parent will produce a silver child, and a silver parent a golden child, and so on, each producing any. The rulers, therefore, have received this charge first and above all from the gods to observe nothing more closely as good guardians than the children that are born to see which of these metals is mixed in their souls. And if a child be born in their class with an alloy of bronze or iron, they are to have no manner of pity on it, but giving it the value that belongs to its nature, they are to thrust it among the artisans and farmers. And if again among these latter a child be born with any admixture of gold or silver, they will honor it and they will raise it either to the class of guardians or to that of auxiliaries. Um, because there is an oracle which declares that the city shall perish when it is guarded by iron and bronze. All right, so in other words, we're going to gaslight everybody. You know what? You weren't actually born here to your parents. You were born underground uh, with the soul mixed with metal. All right. Um, we're going to have to have a lot of, real lot of control over your education to make that one stick. Um, all right, so there's, it's an interesting view. There is a, it's not clear whether he's saying there is a natural hierarchy or he's denying that, right? Uh, I mean, I think he's basically asserting it. Uh, a natural three-part hierarchy. Souls of a different nature than one another that suit you to be in a certain place in the political hierarchy. Um, but we are going to create upward mobility and stuff like that, too. The possibility of it, uh, you know, in the traditional meritocratic vein. In the long run, however, we're going to make this myth of the metals true. We're going to make there be three kinds of people in a hierarchy in our city. How are we going to do that? This uh, more uh, noble lies. <clears throat> later on in the Republic, um, I don't think we're actually going to get to this passage, but uh, he suggests a marriage lottery where we're matching people up. The philosopher kings are matching partners, uh, but we're telling people that they're being randomly assigned a sexual partner to reproduce. Right? But really, we're going to, it's a, it, but really, it's a eugenics program. Um, so we're going to match male cobblers to female cobblers, male soldiers to female soldiers, and male philosophers to female philosophers. And so we're going to naturalize this hierarchy over a series of generations until there really is a three-part, uh, three different kinds of human beings in our city. All right. Uh, now, one thing that's interesting about that is, uh, and this is a strength, I think, of sort of taking this incredibly idealistic approach, like saying, like, not like, well, I mean, it's not my ideals, but uh, like this idealized approach, utopian approach. We can question the customs, the laws, you, you know, the political assumptions that we receive if we're taking this radical project of designing a perfect society. Now, we're gonna see in Aristotle, he takes just the opposite approach. Um, 
and he's much, much more sympathetic with the existing Athenian system than is Plato. You know, uh, which is interesting because uh, Plato is straight up an Athenian person and Aristotle is not. Uh, he's an immigrant into uh, Athens. But he likes the system a lot better than Plato does. Uh, but, but Plato's free to throw out the sexism of Athenian culture, which is kind of amazing, and he basically does. You know, not perfectly or entirely. But, you know, he says that there can be female philosophers as well as male philosophers, female soldiers as well as male soldiers. You know, that's a pretty radical position. Whereas, you know, Aristotle, I guess, has a lot more plausible politics in a certain way. His, his question is more like, how can we move from where we are to someplace a little better? Uh, but he also buys a lot of the extremely problematic uh, assumptions of Athenian culture, for example, slavery, and also uh, a, you know, a really uh, powerful sexual hierarchy, you know, a male, female, um, are conceived as entirely different natures, kind of, or quite different natures. For Plato, they are not. You know, they're, like I say, that, you know, if there are three kinds of men, there are three kinds of women as well. Okay. And so the countenance is much more radical, political, uh, possibilities and solutions than Aristotle ever does. Plato is a utopian in a way, at least in this pro in this project. Uh, and Aristotle is more like a reformer. All right. Um, and so, like the 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 proposals are quite radical. Um, and so he's talking about how the uh, rulers will live. This is uh, at marginal page four one six d. Consider then, I continued, Isocrates, whether the following plan is the right one for their lives, the young guardians, and their dwellings, if they are of the character I have described. In the first place, no one should possess any private property, except as necessary. <clears throat> Secondly, so no accumulation. Uh, no one should have a dwelling or storehouse into which all who please may enter, uh, into which all who please may not enter, sorry, um, whether necessaries are required by moderate and courageous men who are trained to war. Whatever necessaries are required by moderate and courageous men who are trained to war, they should receive by regular appointment from their fellow citizens as wages for their services, and the amount should be such as to leave neither a surplus on the year's consumption nor a deficit. Uh, they should attend common messes and live together as men do in a camp. As for gold and silver, we must tell them that they are in perpetual possession of a divine species of precious metal placed in their souls by the gods themselves, and therefore have no need of the human sort. You don't need no gold. You have gold in your soul. Um, that in fact it would be a profanation to pollute their spiritual riches by mixing them with the mortal sort, because the world's coinage has been the cause of countless impieties. Money's root of all evil, whereas theirs is undefiled. Uh, therefore, to them, as distinguished from the rest of the people, it is forbidden to handle or touch gold or silver. Um, that's interesting. Like, so we definitely do not want the economic hierarchy, if any, and I, there will be, uh, to coincide with the political hierarchy. We want to separate economic and political hierarchies entirely. Um, that's an interesting principle, and we could think about that in, contemp in the contemporary world, what that might mean. Um, he has like a communist, communist system of common property. Uh, th these are really radical solutions. I don't, you know, there's no uh, documented uh, previous thinkers who are coming up with stuff like this, all right? Um, holding property in common, I mean, really questioning all the assumptions of his own culture in a very interesting way, often extremely problematic too, uh, but really quite a radical project. Uh, the sun is rising behind me, I think. How about that? It's kind of cloudy though, so it's not going to be one of these spectacular sunrises. Um, okay, and so, uh, yeah, and uh, like I say, we're going to create and hold this class system in place uh, by eugenics. All right, uh, but it's not that the people who are rule, 
who are ruling are, first of all, as we've seen in the previous books, um, the whole point is that these rulers are ruling for the sake of the whole city, the sake of the people. And all of this is designed to make that possible. You know, how realistic that is, I don't know. Uh, like as, but at Quay ruler, as a ruler, a ruler cares for the people of his city. Um, by definition, like a shepherd with a sheep, etc. You know, you recall these, uh, these previous metaphors. All right. Um, so in book four, we get, for one thing, Plato's definition of justice. It's an interesting one. Uh, let's see whether you think it's plausible or not. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, and it's, the definition of justice is um, that each part performs its proper function. That each part of the city or of the soul performs what it is best suited to do. Right? So that's the way you create a workable whole society. Each part of that society performing its proper function. And that really is Plato's definition of justice. Like each part in these three part structures of the soul and of the city uh, performing its proper function. So the three parts of the soul are reason, which corresponds to the philosopher kings in the city, um, uh, desire, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, spirit, which is kind of like your oomph, your motivation, your power, okay, like personal power, that uh, energy, that corresponds to the auxiliary or soldier class. And then finally, desire, which really Plato regards as base and uh, uh, <laughs> uh, animalistic and, the, and really what is evil, I guess. But not if it's con controlled by other uh, factors. Uh, so the desire, and that corresponds to the people, the tradesmen, the farmers, etc., as he often puts it. All right. Each of those performing, so the, the individual, I'm going to have to, I, I need a board, and I'm going to put this on a board. At some point, uh, the individual and the city are isomorphic. In fact, the entire rea reality in its entirety is also of this form. Okay, uh, three parts: reason, spirit, desire, philosopher, king, auxiliaries, the others. Okay, farmers and tradesmen and stuff like that. All right. Uh, and justice is the same in each system. That is, each part performing its proper function. And, you know, in the, in a individual, when reason, using spirit, controls desire, you have a just person, a virtuous person, a good person. Um, that's why we really got to cultivate reason. Because that's where all the goodness comes from. Most of the Western tradition of philosophy holds, uh, exalts reason like that, basically. Um, all right, and then in a well-ordered city, the rulers represent reason, they have reason, they're rational, and they control through the use of auxiliaries, that is police and soldiers, uh, the rest of the people, and then the city is well-ordered. Uh, yeah, and then in the universe as a whole, just for the heck of it, you have the, the tripartite thing is, we, not, we haven't really studied this, but the forms, uh, ordinary realities, like, uh, you know, this napkin, and then representations or shadows, so like a painting of this napkin, I'm not sure why anyone would paint this napkin, uh, or like a fantasy in your head or something. Uh, so, I mean, this is an incredibly uh, elaborate system. I mean, it's, uh, I don't think there'd be anything like it in any culture before this. Like, you know, a nested series of tripartite distinctions. The, the human individual is of the same shape, the same form, 
as the city-state, as the universe. Right? Um, so there's a cosmic order that is to be reflected in the political order and is to be reflected in turn in the individual, uh, the order of the individual soul. Um, well, I guess that's the, uh, that's the quick and, and dirty version. That's not that dirty, uh, of Plato's Republic's, Plato's Republic books three and four. I hope, uh, the protests get over satisfactorily and soon, uh, and I will see you soon again in the classroom.